Okay, well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about AI and maybe specifically generative AI. Who here has had an opportunity to play around with generative AI? All right. I like that. I like that. Good. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here for what we think is going to be the most interesting, informative, and uh, maybe even exciting panel of the week. Uh, I'm Rodney Zemmel. Uh, I lead McKinsey Digital globally. Um, that's about half of McKinsey these days, and that's all the work we do in AI transformation, in digital business building, and in core technology modernization. But frankly, these days, it feels like all we do is talk about generative AI, because that is all the world wants to talk about. Rather than me introducing my fellow panelists here, we'll run down and they'll each introduce themselves, and then we'll get right into the discussion, and we're going to try and make it uh, pretty snappy as we go. So Caroline, going to go first. Hi, everybody. My name is Caroline Yap, and I am uh, the managing director of the global AI business on the Google Cloud side. We are an engineering function, and we work and partner with our Google Ads division, YouTube, DeepMind, Brain, Research, Earth Engine, etc., bringing a lot of the AI advancements from those other teams into enterprises so that we can help you use AI to get business value. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my name is Faraz Khalid. I'm the CEO of Noon. We're the largest uh, consumer commerce company in the region. Um, unlike the fancy stuff, we bring um, cold bottles of Diet Coke to your, to your doorstep. So uh, nice, nice to be here. Yes, uh, I am Khalid al uh, <clears throat> uh I am the co-founder of uh, Muzun. Uh, Muzun is the leading uh, AI company in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, we have actually started building our own Arabic language model uh, five years ago. It's called OSIS. Uh, and we also have uh, AI products for the financial sector as well. Wonderful. So thank you to each of you for joining me here on the panel today. And I'm going to start with a, a question that's probably on many people's minds. And maybe I'll, uh, I'll frame it by saying, in a... Uh, a boardroom um, about two months ago of a, uh, a Fortune 50 uh, company in North America. And I was waxing lyrical on how AI was going to change the world. And a board member stopped me and he said, will you take a bet with me that generative AI is going to be worth more next year than my NFT portfolio is worth <laughs> this year? So I guess the question is hype versus reality, right? Is, is, is to, to what extent is Gen AI going to deliver real value? Maybe we'll start with Caroline and go down the line. Sure. No, let's start at the other end. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that generative AI is allowing people to experience the, the complex data sets and um, machine learning functions they've had in their company in a way that they've never been able to do so before. So. If they have mapped their entire customer journey and their business use cases correctly, it should actually start to create either, um, and I always tell them to think about this in three ways, is are you looking at AI for uh, efficiencies, for growth, or for the future? And so if they know what the entire journey is for them, business value, customer journey, et cetera, they should be able to identify where generative AI can deliver value in the different phases discreetly. And we're working actually with McKinsey on this as well with the clients, is how are you actually getting those to then deliver the value? And what we have seen in some clients that there's been even a 66% increase in either productivity, which does lead to savings or revenue, depending on how you look at it. And the lowest might have been say 25% increase because it was more in like deep research and things like that. And 66% so, is pretty good for us. Yeah. Yeah, so look, I think, um, fair point, right? This uh, board member you met uh, uh, is clearly skeptical. But um, mm -hmm. what we've seen is th the beautiful thing about Gen AI is that it's already being applied in real business. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that consumers will see, but they will experience because it's already powering key pipelines that we use to run our business. So um, we were just talking a little bit earlier. Um, uh, we're actually Google customers and sort of um, uh, real things, you know, like we're in a business of moving atoms, so products from one place to another. We're already seeing a radical acceleration of time to market when someone wants to sell this bottle. We need to generate content to describe this bottle. We need to translate that content. All that stuff was very sort of onerous and, and Already, like 95% of what you see on our platform 
is run through those pipelines. So uh, it's not something in the future, it's in the present. It provides access, it enables um, uh, optimization of workflows that otherwise would need a lot of um, human involvement. So I think, I mean, for us, it's sort of like we, al we already feel like it's changing our business in a radical way. I cannot quantify it, but I feel like uh, if you were to turn those things off, we would be, um, we would be in a desperate state. So it, it, it's reality for us. And sorry, just to follow up there. So why can't you quantify it? I feel like it's just a, um, it's like electricity. You know, what is the impact of electricity on your business? Like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a huge enabler. It's a utility for us now. So uh, it, it, it cuts across everything we do, and I'm not exaggerating it. So we're, we are going, we're going to work together and quantify it for you. Yes. Okay, sure, thank you. <laughs> there you go, thank you much. Dr. Yeah. Harad. Uh, yeah, I believe it's more of a reality than, uh, than a hype. Uh, it is, uh, well, but I would, I'd, I'd like to emphasize that it's not something new. It is actually basically the AI that we know with, uh, with, uh, maybe with, the, with the advanced engineering uh, that actually made it uh, 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 go through the bottleneck. Uh, I, I'd like to like, uh, make a resemblance to, to the internet. The internet was invented by DARPA a long time ago. It took a couple of decades for people to realize that the internet is something useful and to build business cases and then for Uber and uh, uh, things that are not imaginable even when the, when the World Wide Web was invented to, to, to come up. So uh, for me, uh, Gen AI is the, is, the, uh, is, the, uh, is the web moment when, when the internet uh, came to be known by, by the masses. So it, it is very real and uh, I'll probably take the bit of your friend. Right, that's good. Yeah. Yes, I told him I would take it too. Yeah. And I, I like your point. I mean, we like to talk about it as this is almost the, the Swiss army knife of AI. Before this came along, for every application, you needed a dedicated model. Now you have the one multi-purpose model, but not with no work, but with more minimal work, can then be applied against lots of different application areas. But let's talk about, I can see people looking and saying, okay, interesting. Of course, if you're on the panel, you're a believer. That's maybe not surprising. But where would you start? So maybe for people in the, in the, in the audience, where would you suggest one or two places to really get started? I, I actually have a contrary statement to that. The, uh, the large model doesn't do everything that you think it's going to do. And what we are actually recommending to our clients, um, and of course, um, His Excellency Yasser had mentioned how much it takes to power one of these large language models, right? 26, the elect it's equivalent to 26,000 American homes electricity per hour to power a large model. We actually are recommending on the Google side to have smaller discrete models, domain specific models. So don't think about these models as if they were servers, right? Which is I think the original analogy you were, you were going for, but actually think about it where it's because it's smaller, you can reduce hallucinations, you can combine a lot of the outputs, right, answers to the queries with your data set in a very secure, trusted and private kind of platform, which is what we're providing on the Google Cloud side, so that it knows your business, it knows your brand voice, and it can actually give the right experience, very similar to what you're doing um, at mm -hmm. noon. So, how, so, how do you, so it's smaller models, more cost effective, more specific to your business versus using the big one to answer all of the questions that the internet can, yeah. can provide. I, I agree, this is exactly what we do in, in Mozon, is where we go to customers and customize the, the model for the further use cases. So it, it, it reduces, and I agree that it reduces hallucination a big time. Yeah. And your model runs inside the customer's data environment? Exactly. It is on-prem, yeah. Okay. Or, or on a local cloud, so I mean, okay. it depends. Okay, yeah. but let's come back to the for what, and maybe, maybe for us, you wanna? Sure. I think for us, um, we think of it as sort of two core domains, right? Um, we believe a lot of companies can apply sort of Gen AI interfaces now to assist in discovery of product. So for example, um, whole new interfaces in which we can help people build carts and like select and find product using conversational sort of uh, interfaces. Um, and that's obvious, and people have been trying it with sort of uh, chat GPT and BARD and stuff. Um, and, and that's very helpful. I think replacing the conventional search box um, or the customer service line with a, with a conversational agent is very, very powerful. And, and um, His Excellency Yasser is the chairman of our company, and, 
and, and on the board, like this conversation is there, like, you know, we believe that we can extend, we can make e-commerce sort of uh, go to the masses and become available to the grandmother who is not used to opening an app and searching for things. And can she speak to it in a language that she's comfortable with? Can, can that be voice? And all those things are enabling and access stories. And I think for that, it, there's a very clear use case. And, and similar paths on customer service as well. So we're well advanced in those sort of like workflows. I, I think the other thing that uh, organizational efficiency and, and removing sort of manual grunt work from workflows, this is beautiful. Uh, two core use cases that we're using it for, uh, we've trained a local data set on um, our kind of like, um, our internal sort of like, um, on, on the BigQuery database, so our KPIs and, and, and organizational performance. So instead of going to a, an analyst or a data team to tell me how the sales for this brand have moved over the last six months, you can actually just train a data set and then, then, um, then you don't need the analyst. So replacing internal workflows. And lastly, like on content sort of, I mean on translation and, 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 and transcription, there's insane obvious stuff that people can do and unlock. And I'm sure like uh, businesses of all hues can, can gain from, from these general vectors. That's right. I, I, I add to, yeah, I want to add to that. I mean, so I think a lot of people assume that Gen AI is just about the technology and it's not. Right? Like anything with technology, you have to actually know what you're trying to solve for. And in, in this case here with Noon, it's about it's about customer experience, it's about improving customer experience, it's about enabling customer experiences to demographics you wouldn't normally be able to. Um, we're doing some work, for example, with the government of Singapore there's an older generation who may not be as familiar with smartphones. And so for them, it's easier if they can just press a button and talk to the application to then either file a report about a pothole or something is not working. And in this case, it's to shop, right? It's to get the things that they actually need. And so if we continue to think about it from the human side, right, what is it that you're trying to do that's helpful to whatever the persona or demographic is, the technology itself can then be built as a solution in, in the case that we have with translation and filling in product name gaps and product description gaps. Those are me real and meaningful things, but you have to know what the final output and final outcome is and then work backwards. Work backwards from the valley, that's yes. good. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, would, I would do the same. I'd, uh, I would go, I mean, without understanding the specific domain of, of the business, uh, I think a, a good, a good uh, starting point is, is the customer experience. But I wouldn't go immediately to the fancy stuff of having an AI agent answering the, the customer. I would, I would, for example, transcribe all previous customer interactions and then use the large argument model to understand the... Uh, the, the major issues uh, are, 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 and also create the new features that customers want. This is something uh, generative AI can do now. So I could uh, basically transcribe all uh, last year's, last month, or last week uh, 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 interactions with the customer and then use a large, large, large language model to, to analyze this and come up with insights and suggestions. Yeah, it's quite amazing what it can do in terms of you give it a fairly large data set and say summarize that, identify the key issues, yeah. and then even one further, you know, suggest some remedies for those issues. Yeah. And it's incredible how far it can go doing that itself. Yeah. But let me, let me, let me stay on the, uh, on the barrier side. So hallucinations, sort of a scary word. I have actually a friend who's a, 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 a psychiatrist who says it's the wrong word. It should be confabulations, not hallucinations. But let's stay with hallucin so hallucinations data leaks, how do you manage for all of that? Are these real issues, or these were early issues that we've now got past? Maybe we'll go in the reverse order. Maybe, ah, Dr. Okay. Hyde, you want to go first? Yeah, no, these are very real issues. I mean, I, I still, uh, with ChatGPT4, you could, you could ask, uh, who's Tom Cruise's mother? And it will give you the answer. But if you ask, uh, who's the son of uh, that lady? To, yeah. to this, I don't know anybody who's, who's the son of, uh, forget her name. But, uh, but still, still, still an issue. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the answer, uh, how are we addressing this, is actually to, uh, uh, to, 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 to guardrail the answers more and to suggest more questions if in doubt, so that we don't, we don't get into generating an answer. So uh, ChatGPT is very good at the crea creative side. But if we are answering questions from uh, a, a, a large database or multiple documents, then we try to suggest uh, alternative questions. Do you mean 
this or do you mean that or do you mean that? And then when we answer, we always answer with the reference to the, uh, to, uh, to the place, the document that we get the answer from. Uh, as for uh, data leaks, it is, it is very uh, a very real issue, and that's why uh, on-prem or a local cloud uh, solution is, is, is preferred. It also uh, helps the organization make sure that their, their secrets uh, are, are kept and are not leaked to the, to the competition. Uh, I mean, uh, on, on a macro level, not even on, on, a, on a micro or, or a, a specific document, but on a macro level also, they keep, it keeps their uh, know-how in, in one place. Yeah, um, I think I agree with that. Safeguards in place that also say that overconfidence or lack of fidelity are not problems um, unique to, to, to um, LLMs. But I, I think, I mean, human beings have those problems as well. If you look at a lot of chat transcripts, um, um, agents sometimes generate solutions that don't exist. So, um, but I think like a finely tuned, um, approach to this is, on average, I think, um, perhaps even better. So I'm, I'm, I'm not scared or skeptical. It's just a matter of like being careful and, and using it really well. And I, I know it sounds like a, a sort of nothing burger answer, but like I, I really believe that um, the trade-off with humans is not much better sometimes for these things. You know, like overconfidence in meetings, like, yeah, like, I mean, so you'd say people, Sometimes human beings confabulate. Uh, so, so yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's a great point. So depending on the application area, yeah. it may not need to be perfect. It might just yeah. need to be yeah. better than a human being or even better than a first draft from a human being to have the chance to. And we, we need to be skeptical of both, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. so you don't have to worry about the security and the data leaks because you're running on our platform. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to say that first. Um, so. For us on the Google Cloud side, when we developed uh, our Vertex AI platform, it was very much in mind for security, trust, privacy, and control. And what this means is no data leakage because it's in your GCP project. Even if you have other people in your company with access to your GCP project, Google Cloud Platform, they can't see the generative AI project itself unless you enable that, right? So here's, that's just one example of the level of security that we've put in. The other thing I would also say is um, what we've actually enabled is a client, and I'll use the, the chatbot you know, customer service agent as an example because this is a use case that can be internal as well as external. The, the technology can do, can do both. And what we've allowed is if you were to upload, say, your FAQs, your knowledge-based documents, et cetera, you can now out of the box create a multi-turn conversational chat based on the, pro the things that you've mm. provided. And in the level of control piece, it's these documents, you can answer from that domain, you can then answer from another trusted data source, whether it's a website or something else, or you can also allow for generative AI answers. But you can turn off the generative AI answers where it doesn't even use a large language model in the back end. It's now able to, because of, because of how our solutions have been built, answer questions just from your documents. And that's been game changing from a time saving perspective. Look, uh, I'll just, just to attest to that, right? We've looked at the product, I've worked on the API. It's, it gives you incredible power and control to provide dramatically better response times to customers because most, most problems are in scope. But also, um, as an organization, it gives you uh, incredible efficiency. You know, um, that I can quantify. We believe the contact ratio to us where a human being at, actually has to triage a problem will go down approximately 90%. And we're talking about like a 10,000 person customer support team. So uh, these are very material gains for businesses like ours, and this is not like vaporware, like we're actually testing that API, the exact thing that you, you reference right now. Yeah. So. yeah, we're seeing similar results. But just back on the security question, because I think we are hearing two different approaches here. So yeah. what, what, what would you say to people who are following a on-prem or private cloud approach? Well, for, for us, especially on the Google Cloud side, we or meeting our customers where they are. So we have integrations into your on-prem, you know, as well as your, your multi-cloud kind of solutions. Mm -hmm. Because we, want, we know that customers have choice and we want them to have the choice. And so what we've done is ensured that we've built the security and, the, and, and best in class integrations so you can still do that. 
but for sure, the way we've built our platform, because Vertex AI is, is not just the platform for customers to use, it's an end-to-end -end machine learning platform, as well as the core of which our Cloud AI division develops its products on top of. So our conversational, um, our CCAI, our contact center AI solutions built on top of that. Our healthcare data engine is built on top of that. Our anti-money laundering solution is built on top of that. And so all of those other industry solutions that we have, besides the horizontal solutions like document AI, those are all very, you know, they serve regulated industries. So we have to think about being SecFol compliant and FedRAM compliant, et cetera. Anything yeah. to add, Dr. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, when I was referring to the data leakage, I was referring to the ChatGPT model, mm -hmm. where where all the data, all the queries you sent to it, would immediately be used to uh, to enhance the model, which is understandable. Uh, the, the issue is that during that enhancement, your data is actually now part of, the, of their databases. Yes. So if you are not using that model, that reduces the, the risk. Correct. Uh, although the, the <coughs> with, 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 the, with all clouds, there is the data sovereignty issue, which is, which is a different issue now, uh, which applies to all of uh, uh, all the digital uh, applications. The, yeah, the data sovereignty and data regionalization, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the public cloud providers, and it's not just us, are having to think of in-country, in-region mm -hmm. specific services. But I, I wanted to actually touch on that point about using a public model versus a frozen foundational model that's mm -hmm. for enterprises. Um, we obviously allow customers who want to use our first party models, third party models and open source models. But the way we've done it even for our first party models, it's, it's a frozen model in time. So that when you're actually using it to augment your answers, you're not actually feeding anything into yeah. the model. There's no way yeah. for the model to absorb what yeah. it's actually <clears throat> being, being asked. So all of the things that you're submitting as an input to get an output, those queries, are not actually learned by the model at all. Yeah. But your adapter layer, which is what you're going to use for your tuning, fine tuning, and all of your business parameters within that, that stays yours. So if the foundational model changes, you would just run the same adapters in that pipeline to do the retraining, which is also what, what you've been doing. Great. Let me just pull us back up a little bit, maybe raise one other um, um, uh, adoption barrier that people are talking about. Um, some people say there's a risk this sends us back to 2018 in digital, because this technology is so easy to pilot, right? It's so exciting to use and easy to think of something and pilot it and start it up, that in a big organization, you're going to get death by a thousand pilots, right? There's going to be pilots everywhere, and it's going to be very hard to scale it to get to enterprise value. So maybe this is more of a sort of a, a demand side than a supply side question, but how do you think about this problem of going from pilot to enterprise scale? So um, it, it, I'll, I'm going to take this first. Um, I actually liken what's happening. Oh, I like the music yeah. as well. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, I actually am likening what this, what this whole explosion has been is very similar to smartphones, right? When the smartphones came out, companies weren't ready for mobile device management, right? And so you ended up having this little gap where everybody liked the interfaces on their personal devices more than their, their work devices. So companies then had to catch up. We're in a similar sort of um, paradigm with regards to generative AI. We're all consumers of generative AI at home, and so now we're expecting the same for our businesses, and we're also business owners and we're running businesses. So we are now stuck with, if I don't create and allow my people to innovate with this, I can't retain talent, I can't hire new people because I'm using essentially an outdated way of doing things. So what we've actually found is, and a lot of, I speak to a lot of boards like you do as well, is create a sandbox and create a sandbox as quickly as possible so that you can actually have those experiments. But then at the same time, what are your company's goals over the next three to five years? Work backwards from those company goals and then create the sandbox for those use cases that will deliver to those goals. So then you're not getting the death by a thousand cuts. You're at least working on experiments that will lead to some of those horizons. And that's also very similar to some of the things that we're doing with you know, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for example. For us? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I agree with all of that, but also I think, I feel the optimal strategy for a lot of people who don't have the technical chops in their leadership might be to just wait maybe and see what more kind of reliable or deterministic sort of, um, you know, at scale kind of applications emerge. 
because um, yeah, you're right, like it, it becomes like a buzzy thing and then the CIO, whether they know about it, uh, whether they have the chops or not, they kind of like launch a bunch of pilots and then I mean, the whole thing gets a bad name. But, but I, I think there are, this is deep enough and it's almost like electricity that it will actually be useful. So there'll be like enough skeuomorphic kind of like mm. um, models available for people to apply to their business. And then and it'll just, you, you'll see success in like, you, you cannot apply it to all parts of the value chain. You'll apply to some, some things and it'll scale and you'll be like, oh, this thing works. And then, but don't jump into it without knowing what it's useful for. Um, yeah, and I think it'll be fine. Like I'm, I'm honestly like our, our business has been transformed. Like actually, it, it's kind of like going a lot faster than it could. Like we have tens of millions of SKUs available or, or products available that would take six more months to generate content for. So it's like, so, so, so where, I mean, you raised the, the strategy of wait and see, right? So where would you be <clears throat> on wait and see until the sort of package software version of it emerges versus go experiment with it yourself? Oh, we're all in, like we're, yeah. we're, we're a technology company, so yeah. we're, we're all super deep in. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're at the, we're not the technology layer, we're the application layer, but on yeah. the application layer, we're all in. What are you seeing actually? I was very curious because you probably have a wider aperture of application that you see because it's a fascinating question. Yeah, so thank you for asking. No, but of course. <laughs> yes. So um, I think we're seeing there's three different strategy choices, right? Okay. You can choose to be a taker, a shaper, or a maker. Yep. And in many cases, so it's interesting, when it started, we saw quite a lot of companies who said, let's experiment with it in safe areas, right? Let's go work in. HR will do job descriptions or we'll go scrape LinkedIn and so on. Or in finance, we'll write financial summaries from the core financial systems. We end up thinking a lot of that is a waste of time for most companies yep. because the software industry is going to do that for you, right? Yep. Whether it's you guys or whether it's Workday or SAP, that's going to get built into off-the-shelf products. So there you can be a taker. Some companies will go all the way to being a maker and saying you actually need to build your own LLM as Bloomberg is doing, as Aramco has said they're doing. That's going to be an expensive undertaking, so probably the rare company is going to want to build their own. For most companies, in areas where there's competitive advantage, that's where you should be looking to be a shaper. So picking how do you actually assemble something that is for you, built from assembled, you know, pre-assembled components, but in an area where there's really competitive advantage. Don't bother with it in finance, in HR, in legal. Do it in whatever drives your business. Yeah, yeah for, for, uh, for, for us, when you go to customers, I mean, uh, Gen AI is, is very hyped, and, and uh, we, uh, we check for the signals that those, uh, those people are just checking a box, because they want to tell their management or their board that we are using Gen AI, don't worry, we are, uh, yeah. we are on it. So, so uh, those customers are very risky for us. W what we need to look for is the uh, business uh, ownership of, of, the, of these experiments. And, and they say experiments carefully because they have to start as experiments. I'm not worried about having multiple experiments because it's, it's actually good. As long as the business knows that some of them will fail and some of them will succeed and will grow to, to be embraced. Because you cannot gain, you cannot gain uh, the other sides of the business uh, ownership unless you, you show success. So uh, uh, basically, I'm not worried about the multiple experimentations in the organization. I think it's healthy. and. Uh, Again, it is a spray and pray. Right. But the, right. The, the, it goes back to the business thing, right? We have to, and it's the same even for what, the work that we have, we've been doing with you and, and our joint clients is, what is the business strategy? Where are you actually trying to go? And, and for us also is the, we, we have customers who will fit all three, the, the takers, the makers, and the shapers, you know, because we are also working on helping customers build these type of custom models for them because there's a very discrete industry they're in, like, you know, chemical science, where there isn't a public model that they can then take to then shape. And, like, for example, we've got, um, in, in Palm 2, we've got, uh, which is our family of large language models, we've got MedPalm, where it's for medical <laughs> um, queries and things. Now, we've got, we've got clients now who are wanting to take that and then add their flavor in their specific country or their specific, you know, um, regulations and things and actually trying to, to then shape that to then become a taker. 
So it's been very interesting um, seeing how customers are thinking and maturing that whole value chain kind of conversation and then develop, developing the technologies to deliver it. Great example. So let's talk about talent, right? This is going to a, a discussion we're having in the, in the McKinsey boardroom is um, what does this mean for the talent that we need to hire five years from now? A lot of the things that we think are differentiating in talent today you know, you can now, you know, get on the app, right? Being a good communicator, knowing a little bit about a broad range of topics, doing repeated and analytics well, these are gonna become rapidly commoditizing skills. So what should, what are the talent needs of the future gonna be? What would you advise a 22 year old who's graduating now to focus on from a talent standpoint? Prompt engineering. Prompt yeah. engineering. Prompt engineering. So, so we've been working actually, a, a lot of our, a lot of our top clients are um, actually working with McKinsey to help do a lot of upskilling. AI is not here to replace us. So I'm, I'm, I grew up in Malaysia. I'm Malay, Chinese, Indian, and Portuguese, and I speak five languages. AI can't replace me, but AI is going to replace some of the tasks that I'm doing, or it's going to help augment a lot of the tasks that I'm doing, and as, as highlighted you know, by my fellow panelists here. So we're helping with the upskilling of people because their jobs are changing. Right, or the job functions are changing. So how do we actually help you know, with AI to automate some of these tasks and then allow people to do the higher value things? Is it okay if I use an example here? So um, Wendy's is a, a, a quick service restaurant. It's in the fast food chain in the US. Their, C, his, their CEO came to us and said, you know what? I want people who work at Wendy's to focus on learning how to flip burgers. That's the phrase they use in the States. So, because why would you want to go and work at Wendy's to learn how to cook? Right? You're not really coming to Wendy's to just learn how to take orders and how to just run the cash point and how to, do, I know, how to clean the restaurant. You want to be able to learn to cook. And so as a result, we actually um, now, we jokingly say, our AI recognizes 135 languages plus one, which is Wendy's language. So we helped automate their drive-through order taking. And the reason why that additional language was there because people who come to Wendy's they don't order, I would like a junior bacon cheeseburger. They would say, I want a JBC, or whatever the lingo they might use to order something from Wendy's. So we actually helped take that vocabulary, trained another language model to be able to deal with these customers who were coming into order. At our Google Cloud Next conference, we actually, instead of a drive-through, because it's in a, a space like this, right? We couldn't do a drive-through. The cars would not fit. But we did a walk-through. So in a space similar to this, we set it up where people could walk through with the microphones, with all the noise, order what they wanted, and it would show up on the screen to just demonstrate how when you actually combine mm. traditional AI solutions like speech recognition with generative AI, you can actually solve real world problems. So I want to bring us back to talent. So for, for us, what, what would you advise on talent? Yeah, look, I think it's, it's a fascinating time. I wish I was 21 years old. But I'd rather start at like 17 when, when, I, when I'm picking my major. Mm -hmm. I think it's the return of the sciences. Um, go study math, do real things, because um, uh, this thing is actually ridiculously hard if you want to be in the technology layer. Uh, it's not a surface level kind of like, I'll make UI and things will be good kind of a thing. It's like you actually need to know how to solve problems a hard problem. I so, hope we're recording that so I can send it to my daughter, but sorry. I, <laughs> uh, and you know, I, I really feel like, um, I, I like it because I think um, uh, it, it, it brings back the focus on the hard skills in life. Um, for people who want to be productive, I believe, uh, I mean, all of us know that, that an engineer will become like a 10x engineer or a 20x engineer. I see it in my own coding. I feel like i would given it up because I'm like a suit now, but like, with, with sort of like co-pilot and stuff, I've been able to go back and like I'm, I'm committing more code than I ever did uh, in, in life, so it's actually insane. So it's hugely enabling for people who want to go do things. You almost have like an army of assistants. So it's great. I think from a skills perspective, I mean, there's this old adage that, you know, if it's in PowerPoint, it's AI. In code, it's just SQL. That's not true anymore. Like, you know, you actually have to go build things. Um, I, I, I just think that, you know, um, people should really commit to being experts at the engineering layer and not just the consumption layer, that, that, and there's a huge opportunity because every company in the world needs these people now, right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, uh, I think there's nothing to be afraid of. I think I wanted to address that thing as well, where 
Um, does it take jobs? Does it create new ones? Or does it, does it pay a lot more for people who know how to use? And I think it's an incredible time of opportunity for people to embrace this paradigm shift and sort of like technology and, and uh, it'll be amazing. I'm very optimistic. I think it's both though. Yeah. You yeah. need both. Oh, yeah. so we'll come back to the I, th I, th I think it's both, but uh, for me, I'm the focus was uh, with the analogy of cars. It is on how to make cars rather than how to drive cars. Mm. So, yeah. so f f for me, I agree. I, I would focus for 17 years old on studying math, math, statistics, more math, and computer science. Because I think this is what you need to do to build the next gen AI models. Uh, as for how are we handling talent here, we are uh, lucky with the uh, KGSP program and uh, the, uh, the scholarship program in Saudi Arabia where we, uh, where we send uh, uh, good talented Saudis uh, uh, abroad to study. Uh, so we attract those people and we uh, complement them with the best uh, global talent so that we have five or six fresh, uh, smart, uh, high potential uh, employees uh, mentored by uh, one or two uh, uh, high caliber uh, expat uh, uh, experience in the field. So we have somebody from Google, actually DeepMind, we attracted a few years ago who built our, uh, our Arabic language model. That's mm. great. So we're getting near the end, so maybe we'll close with a, a little round of predictions. And uh, so what I'd like to ask each of you to do, maybe I'll give you a second to think about it, is one prediction you think where we're definitely going to be three years from now, and then one that's a maybe, right? It's not like a maybe science fiction, but sort of a 10, 20% maybe of where we'll be in, in three years. I'll give you each a few seconds to think about it, then whoever's ready to go first, let me know. I'm ready to go. I knew you would be. <laughs> so I don't think that... Um you, you will always need a human in the loop, or what we call reinforcement learning with human feedback. A lot of the technical things that we're going to be building and engineering for is for people, whether it's inside for an internal job, whether it's HR or any of these sort of functions, or if it's for customer facing. So if you only have the engineering capability, but you don't have the real world experience of how someone uses the thing, you're always going to end up building something that doesn't land. And so I think in three to five years, that skill set that human in the loop aspect is still going to be extremely valuable because we're humans and we're designing for humans, right? It's, it, it, what is this conference about? The human, where's our, what's our compass? And how do we use AI for humanity? And that's going to be true. The 10 to 20% more self-driving cars everywhere, that is what I say is like, I think, it, I think that that could be real in right. more countries. It's going to be down to regulation, safety, and, and yeah. risk you know, acceptance. Great. For us? Uh, yeah, uh, I think in three years we'll probably not he uh, hear the uh, term Gen AI uh, a lot as we do today, but it will be uh, very pervasive. Uh, it will be everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we'll be using it, but we'll probably not be talking about it much. Um, uh, I, I forgot my second prediction, so I'll, 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 I'll get it after yeah. you. So. Look, I think uh, we're optimistic and, and very confident that the interfaces we use these days to transact with, uh, to, to consume services are going to change for sure. Like, you know, the way we shop, the way we get customer service, order burgers, um, uh, will, will radically, dramatically change, I think. And, and, and we'll, uh, we'll see that very quickly because they're all low fidelity things. Um, I think deeper stuff like healthcare and, 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 um, and, and those things, I'm, I'm hopeful that something happens and we can like get uh, a non-hallucinating sort of like doctor that we can talk to. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I, I guess like, I, I think the, uh, our ability as a society to get out of the way uh, sometimes is uh, maybe the, the, the constraint there, but, but I'm optimistic that you know, enough progress is being made to at least support the humans who are gonna be doing these things. So yeah, I mean that. And I also hope, my hope is we end up in a situation there where we have enough cars, where we have more cars than drivers because it's also likely that we'll have a lot of drivers and less cars. Uh, <laughs> we should have enough people making cars and enough drivers. So that's a. Yeah. That's uh, I, I think in three years there will be like uh, an app we haven't thought of, uh, of that that is a game changer. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure we will be will be saying how did we think, how didn't we think of it? Yes, I mean yeah. it's very maybe just a closing thought. 
it's quite um, a stark thought that if we were having this panel a year ago, we might not even have been talking about generative AI. Yes. So who knows where we'll be in, uh, in three years. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.